Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world and joining us online or in person here at the Sire Gallery. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Max Espina, I'm a faculty at Sire, and I have the pleasure to be sitting here uh, to my right, David Freeland, uh, with uh, his partner, Brandon Buck, and an amazing uh, design team of Sire students and close collaborators have put together a beautiful exhibition here entitled Views from the Field, uh, on view at the gallery until December 15th. I encourage everyone that haven't seen the show to come uh, and take a look uh, at here at the gallery. Um, I wanted to start today um, with a general question uh, as we approach the the design of the installation and the exhibition here, uh, I wanted to circle in a simple uh, question that we'll be pressing in directly in, in every part of the conversation. And that question is, in my opinion, how images are constructed. Uh, and by constructed, I mean uh, semiotically in terms of meaning, but also tectonically in terms of making, uh, wherein the construction of visual scenes often requires measuring joinery, seeming, and assembly. So I'll get straight to the point. Um, today's images, uh, their viewing and their making are not neutral, uh, nor are they contentless. Uh, yet whereas most of today's architectural critique over image production is centered on the representational capacity of images to express or embody content, subject matter, and cultural codes, or posing them as mere technical substrates with unperceived philosophical impact, I believe the particular investigation of your product here, David, uh, uh, your product and, and Brennan's product, proposes to understand images as material configurations. So, speaking specifically uh, about the product starting point, I'm curious if you can talk about how Orlando Cabamba's photographs of Walter Nash's interiors, and by that I mean specifically how the composition of the image of Nash's complex and almost nested interiors uh, lends themselves to, the, um, uh, to become a scenographic, almost optical uh, device which you and Brandon Kahn call the object. Uh, th thank you for the question, Maxi, um, and thank you to Renan and uh, everyone that helped to kind of put together the talk here tonight. It's great to have the opportunity to talk about the, the exhibition and, and hear questions and um, hear from the students as well. Um, anyone that's in the back should feel free to circulate over to the other, there's some open chairs. Um, okay, so um, I think that for our virtual um, audience, there is a link that's online that will allow you to virtually navigate the exhibition. Or I guess you could do it while you're here, too, if you wanted to just click in. It's, it's a kind of, I mean, on this kind of question of the image, right. we're particularly interested in like the re-flattening of the objects. Um, and so it's, it's really delightful to, to see the re-exploration of the, of the exhibition through that Matterport Im interface um, and from all of your images that you've been taking, all the views. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think, like, uh, starting with Netsch, um, he, he is a very curious character, I feel like, in, in uh, architectural history at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he passed in 2008. Um, th there's never been, a, like, a large sort of retrospective or kind of summary of his contribution to the discipline, but um, one thing that drew Brennan and I to... His work is, it's, it's like you're saying, it's spatial complexity, um, which uh, was very, very intentional. I mean, he, he was working in a time, the 50s, 60s, 70s, he was really looking to develop a kind of, um, almost like a second modernism, um, working specifically uh, with the plan and something that he called field theory, um, which was a, a kind of method of overlapping multiple geometric systems on, on top of each other literally that he did through printing on transparencies, like these lattices that, that, that he would overlap 
And um, I mean, similar to some of the sort of conversations of what uh, uh, postmodernism was, was attempting to address, uh, one thing that he was particularly interested in uh, was the complexity of the program. And so he saw this kind of development of more complex uh, plan-based geometries as a way of kind of addressing the increasing complexity of buildings and the increasing complexity of the architectural program, uh, which is why I think his place at SOM, uh, why that was such a good fit, um, the mm -hmm. sorts of projects he was doing and at an institutional scale, libraries, um, uh, lab buildings, um, really kind of took on, took on that problem in an interesting way. But the, um, these, these kinds of moments that were created though and these, these complex like overlapped lattices, uh, we thought were super interesting spatially. Um, and those were something that were quite difficult to represent. Uh, and we found, so this, this photographer that worked for, uh, worked with, um, with SOM and worked specifically with Natch, uh, Orlando Kabanban, he's a Filipino American photographer um, also, I, I, I mean, we, we didn't find much um, in terms of uh, a survey of his work in the past, but working with the, the archive at SOM, we were able to uh, find photographs of some of these spaces. Um, Kabamit had this really interesting approach to photographs, and you may have seen them looking out at the, the board out there, um, but, but he would allow subjects to just kind of filter through the building and then capture them at particular moments. Um, and so there was this kind of looseness in some ways to how the spaces were being occupied, unlike other sort of modernist photographers who specifically were trying to create a narrative uh, by, by having figures pose in particular ways. That, that wasn't Netsch's approach. Um, and so there was a kind of, and I mean, we hypothesized, maybe this is why he, he, uh, Netsch enjoyed working with Kabanban uh, was because of the way that the figures began to explain this kind of spatial complexity mm -hmm. and, and how it addressed the, the program. Right. Um, right. And so I, I think that his, his photographs are, are, are why we kind of um, were, were interested in, the, in that work. And um, I, I think that the, the photograph, I mean, you were mentioning that uh, it could be a kind of a scenographic or, or, um, right. or optical device. Um, I mean, I, I think that for us, the, the techniques of uh, perspective drawing, which, which disciplinarily are uh, familiar to us as, as architects, uh, are really encapsulated in the way that photographs are made through, through the, the, the single lens. And so that was, I mean, from our kind of past work, our past interest in, in perspective, that's what really drew us to um, these photographs of these spaces, maybe a new way to understand these, these very complex moments. Um, and so the, the way that we kind of arrived at that was like a, a kind of re-objective, like a kind of objectifying of the photograph itself. Right, right, right. That's amazing. We were uh, was talking earlier with David and looking at the photographs uh, which are on display on the Ante room at the beginning of the gallery that doesn't perhaps appear for the online viewers, but I had a I had a difficulty in establishing when looking at the at the photographs whether you're looking you're obviously looking at a single point perspective uh, uh, of the interior space. However, given Nash's complex nested geometries, the lattices that you were mentioned earlier, there is this appearance that there are certain uh, lines of geometry that are converging to the center and other ones that are divergent from it, given the oblique composition, uh, which I thought was, was an amazing technique of, of, uh, of, of, of framing the, the, the interior of the, of the project. Um, my, my second question had to do with that, uh, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, and I wanted to kind of... Uh, zero in uh, closer towards this thing that you guys call the object. Uh, I, I uh, often uh, sometimes call it a kind of optical scenographic device. Um, I'm thinking that the, the act of photographing uh, or composing photography uh, 
uh, at some fundamental level has to do with establishing that frame, right? Establishing the frame of the composition. Uh, in the creating of uh, uh, that image object, it seems to me that uh, in the process of establishing the point projection, you need to engage in both an act of unframing and an act of reframing of the view, uh, which means imposing or perhaps deriving from the subject matter edges and silhouettes in which the image content will begin to hinge or multiply. Uh, and these are my own terms, uh, so I'm, I'm curious to hear you, uh, how, what terminology you use for that. So can you, can you talk us through how you engage in the act of unframing and reframing the image uh, of Kabambans into your own image objects? Uh, well, I mean, I think first um, we wanted to dispel a little bit this idea that there are singular ways of viewing architecture. Um, and th there is this kind of myth, I think, that comes um, from, from iconic photographs that have kind of been burned to the memory uh, uh, as, the, as the canon of architecture. And this is the way architecture is to be seen. And these are the specific ways to see it. And our, our thought was much more that there's, there's many ways of seeing. And so there's not just like a single frame or a single way of framing, but many frames. Um, and so that, that started when we were looking uh, at the original photographs, which, were, which are black and white. Obviously, these are color. And um, that process of colorization, um, or kind of moving from what is a 35 millimeter uh, right, negative right. into something that's, that's clearly much larger, uh, was a process, I guess, maybe like the inverse in some ways of the way that that image was selected. So, um, I mean, as, as you know, many of you may know, like when you're photographing a, a building, there's, there's many, many frames taken, right? right? And through a kind of collaborative process with the photographer, um, some frames are better than others, right? And you, so I, I think the first thing that we, we did is we created many, many, many frames of which some of them are on the wall. It's kind of a reverse contact sheet in a way uh, through AI, going through a kind of colorization process. Um, we, we found multiple architectures, I would say, um, right. in, in a single frame. And, and that's thinking about architecture is not just a kind of question of uh, structure and form, it's morphology, or even just about space, but, but about effect, about atmosphere, or color. Um, so that was a kind of a, a first step. Um, and uh, uh, from there, I, I think the, the idea that we might be able to use the techniques of perspective reimagined through, uh, through digital modeling might, might be a way of kind of breaking in some ways or, or rethinking the, the perspectival device uh, of seeing. And so the objectification of that began with kind of identifying a station point. It's a kind of uh, straw horse in some ways um, because there, there is a point from which each, each of these objects flattens into the image that we started with. Um, but that's, that's really not our sole interest. Um, we're interested in kind of the multiplicity or multiplying that. Um, uh, and, and in the process of creating the volume, a new frame, kind of the silhouette of these new objects is created. Uh, and that's the one that's also projected on the wall, right? right. So that's a kind of, it's a, it's a new frame. And I like the description of it as a kind of hinge because we are flipping back and forth very much between uh, digital and and physical environments. Mm -hmm. And that's in a way what this new sort of frame, this, this frame does. And I mean, I, the last sort of maybe way to think about framing would, would be everyone's photographs that are being taken of this. So the, the, right. the kind of, the field of views created by uh, that, the hashtag, that, that particular hashtag, um, all of which have a kind of equal status, which I, I think is super interesting. Right, right, right. So we could, we could say, so as far as I can see from just looking at this object that we're nearest and the one that we're furthest from, there are perhaps three ways of, of producing that unframing, reframing operation. One, clearly, uh, through the establishing of a, of a silhouette, which obviously changes as you move around uh, or fixates once it's done against the background. And then there are 
a series of internal edges, which we can call faults, for lack of a better term. But then there's the third one, which is the, the oculus or hole in the center, which we are, you are nearest to right now. Um, I'm curious about the, the distinction between those three, how they engage with the, with the particular content of the, of the photograph. Um, yeah, just curious to hear you talk about it. Yeah, I, I guess I, there are some, maybe some more frames. Um, yes. Yeah, the frames of the faces themselves, I mean, the, the uh, willfulness by which the folds are created are really tempered only by its relationship to that station point. Um, and so the, the creasing of the, of, the, of the image, or rather the creasing of the volume on which the image is projected produces a new set of geometries, a new set of spaces. Um, so, so each of those becomes a kind of frame unto itself, uh, for sure. The, the void here, and then also where it's pressed in on the uh, Rotzenheim um, uh, library is really an uh, in interest to try to, um, I mean, find, we, we talked a lot about the backside of the image. I right. think it's something that, that David Eskenazi, I think has maybe, uh, the first time I heard that was from, from him. Um, like, what is the backside of an image? And I, I think we wanted to kind of build on that and like mm -hmm. ask, like, how do you how do you create a hole in an image? Uh, but in this case, there's there's in a way no hole, right? Right. Uh, the image right. is still complete all the way around, uh, but it, it invites in the space of the gallery around it. That that to me seems a, a, a fascinating distinction for for everybody present here, educated and their digital software, we understand one of the many distinctions we could draw between a photograph and, and a digital image in a, in a software is that a printed photograph is single-sided, whereas an image in software, it's double-sided, right? Um, and I like your description of what, what is the backside of, of, uh, of, of an image, which in my opinion, what you just said it elicits certain kinds of particular views, let's just say the, the kind of fixed perspective, right, in which the, the hole reveals another layer behind and reveals that, that backside. Uh, but also in your particular product is certain lateralism, right, which is that the folding of the image invites this kind of meandering around, this 360 degree view. So there is no front or back according in that in that kind of uh, proposition. And I, I kind of find that tension between the fixed point and the, uh, the moving around, which I think the animations in the anti-room begin to show um, kind of a fascinating tension in the project. Uh, I have to share with you, we've been trying to capture that on film like over the past couple of weeks and we're really struggling. Um, we, we love the, 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 the digital turntables where you can see very seamless, the 2D original image, and then how all those folds of the geometry begin to manipulate it as it spins. Um, so we've been trying to produce a parallel sort of track around these in the gallery, <laughs> and it, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to try to get that degree of steady image um, mm -hmm. in, in kind of motion that moves around the object. Uh, but, but no, we're super interested in it. If you have any ideas, anyone, I, I would be, <laughs> Like, you gotta ask these guys behind the yeah, camera here. They're, yeah. they're the we pros. You have to build like a custom track that goes around it. But I, I, I think that that idea of motion though is really uh, important to the, to the work and that there's a kind of engagement or puzzle to, to be unpacked in some right, ways. Right. And maybe this is a way, somewhat an interest in kind of recovering architectural illusion in some ways. It's that through the, the techniques available to, to architecture, not necessarily just, um, uh, kind of uh, an idea about, about form or structure, but that through its kind of it, it, its texture and it, imagining uh, new ways of articulating material, um, articulating depth and other sorts of um, qualities of surface, that that we can invite in a different kind of engagement. That's right. That's that's fascinating. Um, the, the next question, I wanted to uh, go back to this idea of how that, that, that the image is an act of construction uh, and get to your project's 
particular notions of image tectonics. Uh, at least I, I call it that way. Again, I, I would like to hear your, your terms for discussing those effects, uh, material effects. Um, in, in this reminds me of some key terms in digital photography, which I often uh, hear photographers talk about, like image artifacts. Um, that an image artifact is any feature which appears in an image uh, which is not present in the original, uh, in the original image subject, uh, and that includes like color aberration, uh, aliasing, moray. These are undesired effects, right? So digital imaging is in pursuit in, of its total fidelity between the physical and the digital, tends to try to avoid these moments. Um, in its amplification uh, of a small negative to a large image object in a room, you confront directly this inevitable condition uh, of image artifacts or image tectonics. I'm curious to hear you speak about the process in which the image becomes tectonics or acquire tectonic properties from the colorization to the grainification or texturization. Sure, I mean, I think first and foremost, the, the kind of construction of this, this hybrid image, um, image and material, I would say at the same time, it accumulates as a set of layers. First, like you're suggesting like digitally, right? Through a mm -hmm. kind of processing, processing, processing. Um, and then through the actual contact of the print head to the, to the substrate, which is uh, somewhat less predictable, right? Right. Um, I, I think that the, the layers we were intentionally blurring through that threshold. Um, and so the, the, the pixels themselves, yes, they get kind of processed, but um, the pixel is not the, I guess, the filter by which we were working. Um, the texture of the, of this kind of map that was developed uh, was meant to kind of show both the, let's say, the virtual image uh, or the virtual materiality of the, of the image, while also allowing through the the qualities of a particular substrate for different materials, um, uh, plywood, mirror, aluminum, and cork. Uh, so, I think in a our interest was to create these kind of subtle mixings between the two, which allows for a kind of consistent recognition of image, um, the, the image from the photographs, right? But, but somehow it's taking on a different quality. So the, the kind of the inlay of all those different materials is matched with the image in the, um, in the scene of, of Netsch's particular building, um, so as to create a kind of, intentionally a kind of seamless blending of the two. Um, and I, I think in doing so, there, maybe we're searching for a kind of tectonic, but it, mm. it, the ambition was really one that lies be, between those two at the same time. So we're, rather than creating kind of accidents or collisions, let's say, right. um, between, um, between the, the image and its substrate, we're trying to find synchronicities, I guess, um, more so than, than kind of interference. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mean, there, there are all kinds of effects which I invite people to, uh, to see in each one of the, the image objects, but there, there are some particular moments in which pixel projection and grain projection find, um, let's just say, an interesting overlay in which they don't necessarily align, they don't, they don't misalign, but they begin to produce uh, a texture effect that at, at at the very least, ask you to question the subject matter which you're, you're trying to absorb. Uh, to me, those are the, the most fascinating, not to mention you know, many of them you kind of want to pass your hand through. Um, I don't know if you guys should do that. Uh, uh, but um, to me, the, uh, the ones that are uh, also particularly uh, Interesting are the ones over a mirror effect, right? Because they, they begin to invite a different kind of depth in which you all become also um, uh, the subject. Um, just curious about the, the, uh, the different kinds of, um, let's just say, 
image reflections, image effects, overlays of, of grains, and almost a kind of hap haptic effect that begins to transpire in that, in that overlay. Well, I think that those moments are most amplified when the image gets largest, right? So when it's projected on the wall. And those, so when it's projected on the floor and the wall, that idea of transparency or kind of porosity between image and substrate continues, um, where the transparency through the gallery floor or the, or the wall of the gallery um, continues, right? Um, but those kinds of patterns, I mean, that, that was developed through a kind of um, AI training on different kinds of uh, architectural drawing techniques right. and, and uh, Piranesi drawings. And so using a relationship between the material and its abstraction uh, to create a kind of black and white filter or kind of bitmap, um, that's, that's what created these series of edges that allowed us to uh, create these th this different kind of porosities through to the to the material. I, I, I think that you know, that's, that was a highly curated process. Um, and there were kind of many iterations as there were kind of translations of the, the, initial, the initial images. But I, I think maybe it opens up a, a possibility for thinking about image in, in much more, I don't want to say fluid terms, but, but certainly um, not simply based on a set of pixels. Like somehow we have to, I, I think that we were always trying to think of trying, uh, trying to escape the, the composition of image as being pixel based. Right. Um, and thinking of it much more in terms of the content in the image itself and how that might begin to create uh, another layer or set of, uh, set of effects. Right, right, right. I mean, that's fascinating. One of the, uh, one of the, I guess, the customary questions that comes up in this very particular place with every gallery project, I think Christy probably faced those, I did certainly, and, and many others before us, is how do you scale up, right? How do you go from the gallery project to the, you know, to the project out there in the world? Uh, and I know you guys have been testing for it with flatbed printing uh, for quite a while. I'm curious what, what ideas you have on the pipeline as you take this project out in the, in the world, in, perhaps in buildings or, or larger installations and so forth. Yeah, I mean, there's examples of large scale printing. We see them all the time. Um, they're usually conceived of as being more temporal um, and therefore, I don't know, maybe somehow outside the realm of what the architect is supposed to be doing. Um, but uh, I mean, I, we take those as an example of maybe of what buildings could do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for the exhibition, this scaling up, we really saw as a, a, um, a building scale technology that, that printing could be. Cer certainly it's already happening on the, on the interior. There's many examples right. of um, uh, architectural printing on the, on the interior that, that transforms the scale and, and quality of spaces. Uh, when you look at laminates and wallpaper, and I mean, it's everywhere already. Um, the question of how to use it on the exterior is really, I, I think, also a question of layers as well. Right. The, the ink on its own probably cannot achieve the kind of longevity that's needed uh, for, for most buildings. And so it's the layering of, um, uh, of, of laminates and other sorts of uh, sprays or kind of protective surfaces that can be applied to it that will exchange kind of uh, uh, extend that longevity. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we are looking at that in, in several projects. And I think really the thing that holds it back more than anything else is simply that it's experimental. I mean, no one's done it before. And these inks um, and printing processes are developing fairly rapidly. So it's not like right. you can point to a building and say, well, that has a printed facade that's 25 years old and it still looks fine. Um, therefore, give me a warranty <laughs> um, that, that you can't really do that. So it, there's a certain amount of risk taking in it as yeah. well. Yeah. I also was fascinated when uh, you visit uh, any town in Europe and you arrive to your favorite building as, oops, it's under renovation, but there is this giant screen printing uh, on this, in front of the buildings, at least let you see what you came to visit, but you couldn't enter. Um, I, uh, 
yeah, I can't wait to I can't wait to uh, to to see what you guys are working on um, out there in the world. It seems seems like a fascinating project. Um, I wanted to open it up uh, to our audience for questions, uh, our students and faculty alike in this level or in the mezzanine. For those that are looking online, we have two two tiers here. Um, so there is a microphone going around. Emiliano, please proceed. Uh, maybe you guys talked about it. Um, how, what was the process of, of making these? Like, how do you get all these different layers and textures? Like, how this can be smooth and shiny, but then if you look at that edge, it's like you have the, the wood grain on it. Or at least from my perspective, I can see the wood grain. Um, specifically, like the printing process or like the, the volume itself? The, the printing process. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we used flatbed printing. Um, and so there's a composite of layers here, both kind of physical layers of the substrate. So there's a base layer of high-density fiberboard and then an inlay of four different materials on top of that. So plywood, aluminum, mirror, cork. Um, and so we first created each of these facets based on that, that uh, um, those materials. So the kind of the projection came first and the establishment of the volume and then um, the material distinction in relation to the image. So once we had that, we um, took the finished panels, uh, pre-printed to the printer, um, and it, it looks quite similar to a CNC mill. It's like a four by eight table, um, and it printed the entire piece, well, multiple pieces at, at one time, really. And then we assembled the, the pieces uh, onto a, a framework in order to kind of complete it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Hi. Over here, down here. Oh. Yes. Hey. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to any, you do a project that like kind of goes in and out of digital, digital and physical space like this. I feel like there's always surprises. I was wondering if you could speak to any like happy accidents or like weird surprises that kind of came up through the process. Yeah, I think the, while there was a, specifically an interest in mixing of, uh, digital and uh, image materials and then the, the physical materials of the substrate, the balance between those two were, were never really understood at a larger scale. So there's lots of testing, of course, uh, but I, I think that's one of the, the larger reads that I get out of it now, um, that, that we all get out of it, that we couldn't really see before. Um, so I, I think there, there, are, there are moments where you get more image and moments where you get more physical material. Um, that's something that I, I realize now for sure, on the projection points, you read more image. But then on any plane that's more oblique, um, you get totally a transformed texture where you're really reading more of that porosity pattern or the effects of the image as opposed to the, the substrate um, on its own. So I, I think that that's, that's mostly that kind of, uh, an interesting outcome. Also, just like I think, Max, you were talking about haptic kind right. of effects. Um, standing in the space between the object and the projection, um, which is a kind of image space in some ways. I, I think that's also something that was really only able to really be visualized once, once it went up. Right, right, right. Any more questions? Hi, David and Maxie. It's nice Hi. to see you. Hello. It's nice to see everyone here sharing this experience together. Um, I may have missed this because um, I missed the, the beginning of, of the talk, but one thing that I'm always super interested in is a lot of times when we, um, when we work with this relationship with images, like such spatial images, we're looking to make like a two-dimensional space feel more three-dimensional. And what I love about this exhibition is that, you know, it's a 
hyper three-dimensional uh, space that's made into an image that then is mapped onto a hyper three-dimensional object, which has decisions about how it hits the ground, how it hits the sky, how it has profile from side profile to top profile, et cetera. And so I'm sure some of that is based on the workflow, right, of like how these shapes came to be. But I just think from a discussion about object and image, I think I'd be curious where were those moments where the sort of volume and the profiling and the figuration of these things um, came from a particular workflow? And when was there like really clear decisions to maybe exaggerate something or to taper in a particular way? Like how much was the object shaped by you versus the line of where a certain workflow defined that shape? Yeah, I, that's a really good question. I mean, I think um, we actually made five objects, not, not three. And the, <laughs> they're, they're, all five are on the wall. Um, but I, I think the exercise in doing the five was trying to invite as many different kinds of spatial relationships between the three-dimensional volume and the image as we could. Um, and I think over time, maybe the, the willfulness of it was more than anything else, pushing the three objects apart so they all weren't doing the same thing. Um, there's also some things that we learned just looking at the images really closely, which is how different kinds of geometry index the spatial sort of configuration more than others. Um, so, uh, Max, you were observing this in some of the uh, photographs that um, there's like no way to see this as a two-point perspective. Like, everything's a one-point perspective. All the objects rely on being one point. Hmm. That what's multiple sort of vectors is the geometry of the plan. Um, and so I guess that's the thing that we found over time was that because of the geometry of the spaces, the objects, the way that they could be disciplined was different. Um, and I mean, in the end, like the, the quality of the space itself was always like a question, like will the objects turn out differently because the geometry of those spaces was different to begin with? And I, I would tend to say, I would say yes in the end. But it wasn't a kind of direct sort of, well, we'll do these three things and then they'll all be different. Um, it was more like probing the image for those different geometries that existed there. I mean, we, we didn't know what the, we didn't have the geometry of the actual building in front of us. Um, and so th that, we weren't moving based on that. We didn't have a digital model of the building. It all came through reading the Right, right. I, I was wondering about that question because uh, you could, I mean, there are those out there that are going to say like image follow object or object follow image and, and kind of cook that into a kind of mantra that, uh, but I, I, I like your response because I, I think there is a, you know, I'd like to believe that there is a kind of somewhat of a loose fit between image and object, but certain things are more pertinent, certain formal moves are more pertinent than other formal moves given the content of Nash's uh, nested interiors and the present geometry. I mean, they're also like differently programmed spaces. I mean, this is a lab building, that's a library, this is a, this is a house, um, this is his house. Um, and so I, I don't know, that was the other question, like what, would those different qualities of the building maybe somehow play out in terms of the, the objects? I mean, the, the thing that kind of becomes accented a great deal more to me now looking at these is actually all of the, the collection of objects that are inside the spaces. So like the quilt and the books and the chairs in, in the house. Yeah. Right. Right, right. There's one question here with the lady sitting here. 
So I was wondering, when you were going from the digital to the physical, how did you choose where each object was going to go? Because like we have this big blank corner, but you chose to build a wall here to project onto. How did you decide how you were going to do that? Um, I mean, the I think part of the choreography of the space and moving around the objects was about how to stage them in the gallery, such as to create movement. Um, so I think that there is a kind of interaction that's happening between them, even though it's not one that's directly about perspective or directly about projection, um, which is about how to kind of um, capture these particular viewpoints. Um, so as you enter, there's an immediate sort of registration of the, the 2D flattening of this object. And then as you move around it, you kind of are compelled to kind of move around in a particular way. Um, I think that's what we were trying to do is move people around the gallery by, by the way that they were moving around the objects and looking at the images. Like, but the, the wall itself was about making discrete openings by which to come in and to leave. Um, and also in the case of this object, making an opening that was somehow related to the, the perspective and the projection of the object itself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I actually have a, how many, how many people enter through this side? I'm, just, I'm always curious to know. Like when you enter the gallery, how many people enter through this side versus over here? How many enter over here? Is the right, the right side enters. The right. Yeah, do most people enter over here? Okay. All right, well, that's what we thought might happen. <laughs> and then you leave through that side. I don't know. I think that kind of um, choreography, though, in a quite a large space with small objects was kind of is tricky, but that, that's what we were trying to do. Thank you. Right, right. Um, I had a question about the objects kind of relation to the ground in the space. Um, and I've, I've always been like really interested in the, the way that you're kind of lifting them off the ground um, and how it kind of is almost like video game-ish, how it kind of sits and I can imagine it like spinning and kind of hanging or something. And I wonder like what your guys' um, attitude was towards the ground and if there's ever a version of this exhibition where they can be like hung from the ceiling or something. I mean, that's an interesting thought. I mean, I, I, the idea was that they're not grounded. Um, like they can't recognize the datum of the floor. They, can, they have to recognize the datum of your eye, eye height. Um, or, and, and they vary somewhat and recognize that not everyone has the same eye height, um, which I think is important. But yeah, the, the base was really about trying to disconnect them from the ground. Um, and the, yeah, the mapping of the floor surface off onto the, the base was, was part of that. Um, but, and then at the same time, the projection back onto those surfaces, I think, was also important, like being able to recognize the boundaries of the space, uh, but with an image that also undoes, undoes those, those boundaries. I have one, one more question that I've been thinking about, uh, David, that I've been seeing you and Brennan doing since the second house, I guess I can count those image models, right? Um, and let's just say that's one scale of approximation to this problem. And the second one or second scale is the one that we're inhabiting right now, the, the one of the installation or exhibition, however we want to call that. And here we can begin to see the effects we talked about earlier, you know, haptic effects, effects are layer, uh, over the image. I'm curious, what are, the, what are the questions that lay in that third instantiation in the image building? Um, what, what other potentials could we, could we imagine at that, that full-blown scale uh, of, uh, of, of images uh, map on, on building materials, but perhaps also on glass? Uh, on, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine the full material flavor this thing could take uh, in, 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 in a building out there in the world. Um, I mean, I, I think that there's um, a questioning of 
architectural surface as being solely a kind of materialization of uh, an idea about form and organization that we're getting at and opening up other dimensions for, for how to think about boundaries and edges. Mm -hmm. In a moment when the depth inside our digital devices is kind of infinite, I, I guess we wonder what the depth uh, is that's possible inside the surfaces that, that, that define our spaces. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that maybe printing is a way, maybe a way to unpack that at an architectural scale. That's great. Well, thank you so much and congratulations for this amazing uh, project uh, to you and Brennan, which I think must be online uh, watching close to us. Uh, congratulations. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to this conversation. It's also a pleasure to be here in the gallery today. So thank you. Ah.